My dearest friends, allow me to extend a warm greeting to each and every one of you on this most auspicious occasion. No matter where we are located within the galaxy, whether it is on a far-flung mining colony, out in the depths of the ghoul stars, or if we are nestled upon the shining bosom of holy terror itself, when we crane our necks and look to the void of space, there will ever be a twinge of fear to strike at our hearts. Despite the galaxy being rightfully ours, there are untold and unimaginable horrors which lurk out in the dark, where they simply lie in wait for their moment to strike and prey upon our mortal souls. Hideous demons of chaos, spawned from our own emotional energies, will desperately claw their way out of unreality, seeking only to feast upon our very life essence. The rampant green-skinned brutes of the orcs have pervaded near every star to loot and wage a barbaric war against all they find purely for the ruthless thrill which they gain from bloodshed. Upstart Xenos species such as the Tau have foolishly laid claim to hundreds of stars and whilst they preach the importance of a greater good, they show no remorse for deploying their fire-cast warriors to purge the worlds of man. Even looking outwards from our galaxy, the hordes of extragalactic tyranids have spied the Milky Way as a veritable feeding ground, and they will not rest until every world has been harvested and left as a barren rock, destined to drift through the emptiness of space for the rest of time. But even with these constant and ever-present threats, the men and women of the Imperium may sleep soundly at night for they are protected by the indomitable forces of the Astra Militarum. In the far future of the 41st millennium, it is the sad truth that we are engaged in a never-ending war, and yet the fighting forces of the Imperial Guard have ever stood resolute as an unbreakable shield against the many enemies of man. Even with the venerable chapters of the Adeptus Astartes descending as blazing angels of the Emperor, the vast majority of conflicts will be fought almost exclusively by the Astra Militarum, and it is only through their unshakable will that has allowed the Imperium to persist throughout the long millennia. With that being said, today we are to explore the founding tale of the Astra Militarum. I shall first give a broad overview as to their organizational and operational state throughout the galaxy before moving on to their inception during the days of the Great Crusade. After we will go over the Grand Reformation, which occurred in the wake of the Horus Heresy, and see how this molded the Imperial Army into the Astra Militarum as we know them as today. But now, without further ado, let us don our combat fatigues and delve into the regimental scholariums to learn of the stalwart defenders of humanity, the Astra Militarum. Throughout the Imperium, there is no army which is larger, more dynamic, more resourceful or more adaptable than of the Astra Militarum. It is made up of the valiant men and women of the galaxy who have pledged their lives towards the defense of our species by facing even the most incomprehensible of dangers which prowl about in the darkness of the void. They are prepared to never again see their homes and to lay down their lives on some distant and blasted rock light years away from their families purely to safeguard humanity against the horrors of the galaxy. Whilst some of you may scoff at the notion of mere natural-born humans standing up against the myriad of titanic foes which exist throughout the void, we must understand that there exists an endless source of strength from which the Imperial Guard will ever draw from. This is something which is intangible, or ephemeral even, but it glows from within the hearts of each soldier who has pledged themselves to the Imperium, and it would be their indomitable courage. 
whilst yes, they are but mortal men and women, but they are prepared to hold the line against any who would threaten the iron cradle of the Imperium. And it is from this unshakable determination and unbreakable morale that will safeguard humanity through until the end of time. We could spend countless hours seated around a campfire, retelling stories of Imperial Guardsmen who matched the gaze of charging greater demons and yet did not break in rank. There are soldiers who have affixed their bayonets and leapt headlong into battle with orcs thrice their size simply because they knew that the Emperor protects and that they have a duty to defend all of mankind against its eternal enemies. Even in the apocalyptic scenario upon Cadia, where a Blackstone fortress crashed its way into the world, breaking it asunder from the sheer weight of its immense bulk, the guard held fast, and they themselves refused to break. This adamantine will is all but required for an army such as the Astra Militarum, for how can you be expected to stand tall against the dreadful terrors of the galaxy unless your heart has been steeled against the revolting monstrosities? Thankfully, however, the fighting forces of the Guard were never expected to hold the galaxy on but their everlasting resolve alone. The Astra Militarum is made up of untold billions of soldiers who will stand shoulder to shoulder against the horrors of the galaxy, ever prepared to give their lives to protect the Imperium. Their equipment, whilst meek compared to that of the Adeptus Astartes, is by no means ineffective. Clad in durable flak armor and carrying potent las guns into battle, the great regiments are more than capable enough to bring any foe to heel, so long as their logistical lines are not disrupted. It is a common misconception to presume that the Astra Militarum officers will be content to simply throw their guardsmen to their deaths as a human wave designed to overwhelm their enemies, but this would be a gross simplification of their utilization of infantry. Depending on the regiment, some armies will be more suited to mass deployments of soldiers. However, it would be a great disservice to the erudite officers and generals to reduce their actions in this way. In truth, battles will be meticulously planned out, with complex, multi-layered defensive networks being built up, whilst combined arms operations consisting of infantry and their supporting units will be pushed forward to seize and overrun their adversaries. With that being said, however, when you have a military as broad as the Astra Militarum, sometimes poorly operated maneuvers involving human wave tactics will be initiated, and regardless of their effectiveness, we must remember the fallen as martyrs who died for the Imperium. In any case, the infantry will never be deployed alone, and you can be sure that each squad will be supported by a vast array of mechanized units, each of which has been constructed to serve a specific purpose upon a battlefield. Transportation vehicles, such as chimeras or toroxes, will carry groups of soldiers to the front lines, all while providing light covering fire to support the freshly deployed soldiery. Whilst these mechanized units and their embarked infantry are truly vital to each and every military operation, we must recognize that some of the heavier armor can be considered as the backbone of the Imperial Guard. Hulking Lehman Russ and Rogel Dawn battle tanks will spearhead their way forward, crushing their enemies beneath their iron treads and reducing heavier targets to blazing wrecks under the weight of heavy Imperial ordnance. All the while, artillery units consisting of basilisks or manticores will be raining down salvo after salvo of heavy explosives, shattering the defensive capabilities of any who thought that they could stand strong against the might of the Imperial Guard. This is only a small example of the capabilities provided by an Astra Militarum force, 
but a regiment will be equipped to face off against almost any foe which may be encountered within the galaxy, and you can rest easy knowing that the indomitable spirit of mankind will find a way to endure these abject horrors. Whilst the great angels of the Adeptus Astartes, or even the venerable and reverential members of the Custodian Guard may be incredibly effective in battle, they are simply not numerous enough to defend the Imperium against the many enemies which have spied mankind as their deadly rivals. In a galaxy as large as our own, torn asunder by the formation of the Cicatrix Maledictum and inhabited by an uncountable number of nightmarish enemies, each pushing their way ever deeper towards our hearts, it could only be an army as vast as the Astra Militarum who could defend us through this long night. No matter the segmentum, no matter the war zone, and no matter the world, the Imperial Guard will be marshaled and ready to respond to whatever ancient dangers lurk and prowl about in the Stygian darkness of the void. Being that they are an astonishingly broad military force, the Astra Militarum will be subdivided and split into a series of incredibly distinct regiments. These are the most basic of organizational units within their army structure and have persisted in this form since the Great Reformation which occurred in the wake of the Horus heresy. Each regiment will have been founded from a single imperial planet and so it makes sense that they will be made up of individuals who hold unique cultural practices, customs, tactics and identities from one another. The vast majority of these will be tolerated, for the High Lords are too far removed to care for such differences, and they only seek one thing, and that is to have an able-bodied army of soldiers who will fight and die upon the distant worlds of the galaxy. Because of this, regiments will be incredibly diverse in their appearance. They will be permitted to wear whatever apparel they choose, carry unique equipment into battle, or even perform strange quasi-ritualistic practices during a battle, and so long as these fall within the purview of the Imperial Creed, then none will bat an eye at their proclivities. With that being said, should any guardsman start to display worrying traits of insubordination, then the regimental commissars will be quick to charge this individual for their crimes of cowardice, and they will be swiftly sentenced to death. In any case, whilst the cultural practices of the regiments will be permitted, the soldiers of the Imperial Guard will still be expected to fall into the typical command structure of their superiors. Company commanders, regimental generals, and Lord General militants will issue orders to the various platoons of a regiment, and their commands must be followed to the absolute letter, lest they risk the entire group being declared as renegades. Quite typically, given the differences between regiments, it makes sense that many of them will be highly specialized to a certain art of war. For example, the Katakan jungle fighters are second to none at waging war beneath the treacherous canopies of deadly jungles. Conversely, the Valhallen ice warriors are specialists in fighting through the icy battlefields of the galaxy, where they have become infamous for absorbing truly horrifying levels of casualties while still holding the line against their foes. Each regiment will also ascribe to a specific combat doctrine, ranging from specializing in offensive infantry maneuvers to seeking battlefield superiority through overwhelming artillery fire or by spearheading their way to victory with large mechanized tank battalions. In addition to these differences, we must acknowledge that not every world can supply the same volume of troops to a regiment. Some planets may be home to several immense hive cities, providing a constant stream of tens of thousands of recruits per day, whereas other, less inhabited worlds may only be able to supply a thousand soldiers over the course of an entire year. Because of this, some regiments will be fairly small, meaning their operational capacity is similarly limited, 
whereas others will be so vast that the world can form dozens of regiments, each of which will be specialized into a different form of war. In these situations, where a world may draw up several regiments, then they may come together to form incredibly complex or innovative battle plans, with dynamic or groundbreaking movements being coordinated between the various specialist battalions, all to claim victory from the jaws of their foes. But despite this, we must recognize that there is still strength to be found in numbers. And if there is anything that the Guard is not short on, it would be manpower and munitions. Millions of lives may be lost in a single grueling offensive, simply to claim a single objective. But this is a sacrifice which the High Lords are more than willing to make. An ancient Eldari battle host may be comprised of only a few hundred members. And as such, there is little that they may hope to accomplish when faced off against several million guardsmen, each of whom knows that the Xenos are some of mankind's eternal enemies. No sense of flair or archaic technological ability will be able to defend them from the full brunt of the Imperial Guard pressing down upon them. And in truth, there are almost none who can withstand the great bear of the Imperium once it has clamped its jaws around you. The skies will be occluded with untold thousands of aircraft, dropping the annual munitions output of an entire forge complex in mere hours, turning the battlefield into an apocalyptic and tattered death zone. Artillery batteries will stretch out for miles, raining a constant barrage of heavy fire to reduce even the most highly fortified of defensive structures into ashen rubble. But if there are any who may resist this bombardment, then they will quickly find their situation as being untenable as they are annihilated by the onslaught of armored tank formations supported by the millions of valiant guardsmen striding ever farther into enemy lines to bring the emperor's justice to his foes. Such are the numbers of guardsmen who are deployed into a battle that casualties are only provided as rough statistical estimates, as this scale is nothing short of dehumanizing to the soldiers who are sent to participate in them. None can fathom the levels of death which are absorbed by a regiment during a single conflict. But alas, this is something which the Lord Commanders and High Generals cannot dally over. When they have been sent to contain a threat to the Imperium, every soldier no matter their rank knows that this may be their last deployment, and they have been trained to give their lives if it means that the meek and poor members of humanity may rest easy for but a single extra night. Rather tragically, it is not unheard of for Imperial forces to sustain a 100% casualty rate, but so long as their objectives have been achieved, then this conflict will still be chalked up as a victory and the fresh replacements for these fallen heroes will be quickly deployed to take up their places on the new front. Millions upon millions of men and women may be deployed for a single battle, and yet it is oftentimes the bravery of but a single guard squad which will inspire the rest of their comrades to charge forth and claim the day for the Emperor. In battles where a defeat appears to be inevitable, and where lesser men would fold in the face of chaos, we must remember that this is not the cloth from which the Astra Militarum was cut from. Somehow, and some way, the fighting force of the Guard will push forth against the dying light, ready to hold the line with naught but their own faith and fervent determination left to fuel them. Even if they do not stand with the pinnacle of technological armaments or with cybernetic augmentations, it does not mean that they will ever be prepared to back down in the face of danger. They will stand against the dark as the greatest bulwark of humanity ever formed. And it is from the strength of its men and women which will allow the Imperium to withstand the tumultuous chaos of the galaxy for untold eons to come. 
Now that we understand a little more about the ever-dependable strength of the Astra Militarum, we should now look at it from a historical perspective, for it did not always exist in the form which we see it as today. In truth, the Guard, much like the Imperium itself, has evolved and changed over the long millennia, growing from but a force which was originally intended to act as humble planetary defenders, to one which now stands ready and able as galactic conquerors. The founding of the Imperial Guard dates back to the destined days of the Great Crusade, where the Emperor first led his mighty legions of Astartes throughout the stars to reclaim the cosmos as our true birthright. During this period, the Marines, led by their demigod Primarch Jean Fathers, carved out the burgeoning borders of the young Imperium, planting the flag of humanity once more on countless worlds and bringing many rebellious or insurrectionist regimes to heel under the weight of their power-armored boots. But whilst the Astartes were unmatched in their ability to quickly subjugate the stray sheep of humanity, there was an entire galaxy to conquer, and so they were always quick to depart from these worlds shortly after order had been restored. The Astartes legions pressed outwards from holy terror, with all the momentum of the Emperor propelling them forward, and they rode atop that crest of devotion as if it was a rushing and torrential wave. Their constant onslaught through the stars did mean one thing, however, and it was that they were destined to live at the vanguard of the crusading fleets, meaning that they were simply unable to remain and defend the worlds which they had so painfully beat into submission. As such, the Emperor, foreseeing the dark possibility that these newly recaptured worlds would soon fall into anarchy, and rebel against the young Imperium ordained that there should be a new military organization who could protect and safeguard the many planets of mankind. Thus, he founded the force, which was to be named as the Imperial Army. In their original formation, this army was incredibly distinct from the regimental structuring which we would witness today. It existed as a relatively loose conglomeration of voluntary fighters, mercenaries, and of the surviving elements of pre-existing armed forces which persisted through the subjugation of each planet. These various groups would then come together as something which resembled a common militia more than anything else. They were ordered to keep the peace and to ensure that each world remained loyal to the Imperium, but there was little expectation for their role to be expanded beyond this. That was, however, until the Great Crusade started to reach its stride. As the fleets pushed ever outwards into the depths of space, it soon became clear that the small contingents of the Imperial Army would need to be greatly bolstered, as there were many trials and challenges which were becoming increasingly common across the Imperium. Facing the mounting pressures of alien armies, rebellious governors, and non-compliant councils, the Imperial Army was steadily expanded until it became more akin to the planetary defense forces of the 41st millennium. At this stage, their armies were far more standardized, with there being a regimented form of organizational structure persisting throughout the entirety of their armed forces. But despite this newfound framework, the army was still only to be expected to remain upon their designated worlds, simply to keep the peace, and to ensure that all would remain loyal to the Imperium. Despite these intentions, the ravenous demands of the Great Crusade only grew in scale, with the fleets requiring more and more resources to continue on in their endless march through the cosmos, until they reached a pivotal moment where it finally became clear that the Astartes could not go on alone. As the borders of the young Imperium stretched beyond the chaos of the Maelstrom, the Astartes were becoming more and more reliant on the actions of the stationed Imperial armies from nearby star sectors. 
Initially, this began as small supportive operations with mechanized units being used to shore up logistical routes between the front lines and defensive positions. But their role was soon to be elevated to a far more prodigious position. As the crusading fleets pushed ever eastwards, the Imperial Army was continuously restructured and reformed. And by the time the Imperial borders reached the farthest expanse of the Eastern Fringe, the armies of mankind were now considered as an integral and far-reaching arm of the Imperial War Machine. They were no longer reliant on the vessels of the Astartes, as they had been graced with great warships and fleets of their own, which, whilst smaller than those of the Marine Legions, were still large enough to shatter any upstart empires which may threaten the young Imperium. Due to how the Imperial Army had grown in accordance with the expansion of the Great Crusade, it is understandable how their command structure was innately tied to the Adeptus Astartes. The forces of the Space Marines were instrumental in uplifting the position of the Imperial Army troops from planetary defenders to stellar conquerors, and as such, their armies were always to be subservient to the commanders and captains of the Astartes legions. The 18 Primarchs, who stood at the end of the Great Crusade, were seen as being unshakably loyal to the Emperor and to the wider Imperium, and so none upon terror found any fault in leaving the Imperial Army as what was essentially an auxiliary force to the Space Marines, since they would always be utter paragons of faithfulness to humanity. That was, however, until the events of the Horus Heresy transpired. As we are all well aware, during the 31st millennium, the arch-traitor Horus betrayed the greater Imperium and led a rebellion with eight of his fellow Primarchs against the Emperor, seeking to depose his gene father to curry some form of favor from the dark gods of the warp. As some of you may be able to guess from my previous points, this heretical uprising was not to be limited to the Astartes alone, as they also dragged the valiant yet ignorant members of the Imperial Army down with them. Whether it was out of a perceived loyalty to their Astartes masters, for a personal lust for power, or even from their simple fears of retribution should they refuse, those who had been attached to the Nine Legions which betrayed the Emperor were compelled to throw in their arms with the traitors and turn their backs upon the Imperium. Unsurprisingly, this aspect of the Horus heresy caused just as much damage as the downfall of the Astartes, and the actions of the fallen Imperial Army soldiers was instrumental in plunging the galaxy into flames. Untold millions of veteran warriors, battle-hardened from the long years of the Great Crusade, had now turned their vast armaments towards Holy Terror itself, and due to their immense reserves of manpower, they were more than capable enough to swarm and drown those who had remained loyal to the Emperor. The vast fleets turned their guns upon the loyalist worlds of the Imperium, bathing them in torrents of fire before deploying their mechanized battalions to purge all who would reject the word of the fallen War Master. Old rivalries between planets were reignited by the flames of rebellion, and sectors were plunged into wars purely in the pursuit of vengeance against those who subjugated them during the days of the Great Crusade. But rather sadly, these petty squabbles of pride would soon be marred by a great moral collapse within the Imperial Army. As the long years passed, more and more of the turncoat Imperial Army units fell prey to the insidious sway of the ruinous powers. Meager men and women who had originally pledged themselves to the Imperial Creed were now found to be invoking demonic rituals or building up great effigies to the Dark Gods, desperately hoping that they would be granted some form of immaterial power for their offerings. But oftentimes, this was not to be their destiny. Most who fell victim to the whispers of chaos 
were met with damnation. Demons who tore their way through from unreality did not emerge from the warp to grace these mortal fools with gifts, and instead it was to voraciously devour their souls. Meanwhile, the majority of the traitor Astartes did not regard the men and women of the Imperial Army as being worthy of their presence, and so there was little, if any, respect held for the troops. As a result of this, most of the humans who had fallen in with the turncoats were deployed as simple cannon fodder to shield the far more valuable marine forces. This may be preferable to the darker alternative, however, as some of the more twisted of Astartes would revel in sacrificing huge contingents of their Imperial Army soldiers, using their stolen souls as a bargaining chip to draw forth some form of power from the warp. But even with this careless attitude of the Astartes, deploying millions of Imperial Army units en masse was still an effective tactic which caught the loyalist elements of the Imperium off guard. The many battles and conflicts of the Horus Heresy were only made that much more difficult thanks to the presence of the human soldiers and whether loyal or turncoat, the prodigious size of their ranks and the presence of their mechanized units made them a true force to be reckoned with. Despite the combined strength of the Imperial Army and heretical Marines on the field, we are all well aware of the chaotic end of the heresy, where the Emperor was able to strike down Horus, but in the process was pushed to the brink of death, and so was interned upon the Golden Throne, where he has remained until this very day. The Imperium had been left in a truly tenuous state following this rebellion, with thousands of worlds having been lost to chaotic uprisings, and in many ways it seemed that the dreams of unifying the stars under a great banner of humanity had been dashed to die amidst the void. When it came to the Astartes, there was a single decisive decision made to ensure that a rebellion of this scale could never again come to plague the fledgling Imperium. Robute Gilliman, in conjunction with the High Lords, agreed that the surviving nine legions should be split into smaller chapters, which would be of an appropriate size to act as an effective and specialized military force, and yet would be too small to attack the Imperium to the same scale as was witnessed during the calamitous Horus heresy. The implementation of the Codex Astartes as well as from the newly formed divisions between chapters, was indeed effective in curtailing the very much apparent threat of a second Astartes rebellion. But a similar solution would have to be found for the young Imperial Army. Whilst the danger posed by the Astartes was clearly significant, some upon terror were far more concerned at the willingness of the Imperial Army to turn their backs upon the Imperium. None were exactly sure of how many soldiers now stood within their ranks, but surviving regiments were still bolstered by untold millions of troops, potentially hundreds of thousands of tanks, and enough stellar void ships to blockade the Sol system for a seemingly indefinite amount of time. As such, it was clear that the threat of an upstart human army would have to be neutered here and now, lest it prove to be the ultimate downfall of the wounded Imperium. The High Lords therefore convened and made a series of sweeping changes to the organizational structure of this once mighty armed force. Their first decree was to abolish the Imperial Army as it stood. The emergent threat of having millions of soldiers being willing to respond to the directives of Astartes' captains with no real methods of holding them accountable for their actions was simply too dire. And so the current leadership structure had to come to an end, once and for all. This was not to say that the army was to remain permanently leaderless, but it was obvious that it required a more structured format going forward. 
Despite the treachery that had occurred, the High Lords understood the effectiveness of a fighting force as large and dynamic as the Imperial Army had been, and so the concept of an army of human soldiers was not to be abandoned by the Imperium. As such, in the wake of their disbandment, the newly formed organization of the Imperial Guard was founded. This was to be made up of the men and women of the galaxy who would forever pledge their lives to defending and safeguarding humanity against the various horrors of the stars. And yet, they were to be far more disciplined in their new state. In a similar manner to the later stages of the Imperial Army, recruits would be made up of a varied mix of drafted aspirants and volunteers. But in both cases, they would be required to go through a rigorous training regime to ensure that they were of the correct stock to serve on the front lines. For those who failed in this program, all hope was not lost, for they could still serve the Imperium in a different manner. The Guard would still require auxiliary support units, logistical servants, and even the worlds themselves would need stationed planetary defense forces to help maintain the peace. Because of the sheer size of the Imperium and of the myriad needs which the Lords had, so long as a volunteer stood as an able-bodied human, then they would surely have a place to play within the great war machine of mankind. But it was no longer safe to have an army as vast as theirs if it was not appropriately regulated. The High Lords couldn't be sure that the directives and orders of the Adeptus Astartes would always be entirely aligned with the well-being of the Imperium, and so it was decided that the Guard would no longer be subservient to the wishes of the Marines. Instead, a strict and regimented command structure was implemented across the entirety of their armed forces. The High Lords themselves would be the ultimate directors of the strategies taken for the Imperial Guard, and their orders would be passed down the long chain of command as a single, unbroken link. The Lord Commander Militant, who sits atop their council, will send their decisions down to the Lords of the Segmentum Command Units, who will then be responsible for cascading the strategic maneuvers and plans to his own subservient commanders and generals. Whilst, yes, there does exist a single interconnected link between even the most humble guardsmen to the Lord Commander themselves, this does not mean that this system is perfect. The Imperial Guard is an incomprehensibly massive organization which is forced to project itself across the vast expanse of our galaxy, meaning that miscommunications and errant commands are an unfortunate inevitability. Messages must be sent through hundreds, if not thousands of commanders, noble lords, and even administrative agents before they reach the front lines. And so at times, orders can become mistranslated, resulting in inappropriate actions being taken within a campaign. For example, during a conflict known as the War of Foretelling, a tendril of the reviled Tyranid Hive Fleet Leviathan was rapidly approaching the Vonost system. And although the Lord Commanders sent an apt strategic plan to the Imperial Guard, the chain of command was destined to fail this day. Due to the reality-bending nature of the hive mind, which projects a great shadow through the warp from its hive ships, the astropathic messages from Terra became corrupted and garbled when they reached the presiding generals. As a result of this, the lords of the Segmentum command post received their astropathic message as a single indecipherable bark, and yet the word of the High Lords is to be followed to the letter, and none are to disobey an order sent directly from Holy Terror. Whilst dismayed, the commanding officers could not refuse their directives, as the presiding commissar forced them at gunpoint to abide by the sent message, and so the garbled, corrupted bark was cascaded down to the Imperial defenders within Vonost. 
Unsurprisingly, the Imperial Guard forces could not mount an appropriate tactical plan based on these orders, and as such, the system was lost within a short month, with the defenders succumbing to their fates purely as a result of a miscommunication. The second sweeping change made to the Imperial Army was the decision to sever the link between the forces who would be deployed on land and of those who would sail through the inky depths of space. As I previously stated, the sheer size of the former Imperial Army combined with their immense fleets meant that a treacherous rebellion sparked by their commanders could prove to be an existential threat to the future well-being of the Imperium. Their vast armadas were so large that they would be able to effectively blockade hundreds of strategically vital worlds to the Imperium before launching devastating orbital bombardments or planetary invasions, and this was an eventuality which simply could not be allowed to come to pass. As such, the ships would now fall under the command of the newly formed Imperial Navy and it would be their responsibility to handle all strategic maneuvers and operations throughout the expanse of the void. If a land-based army required transportation to a far-off world, then their commanders would have to communicate their needs with the High Admirals of the Navy, and this request could always be denied if those lords saw the action as suspicious. In this sense, the Admiralty was to act as something of a second check to some of the decisions made by the Imperial Guard, and if they denied a request, then the operational scope of a traitorous Guard regiment would be almost entirely limited to a single world. Many of the changes implemented in the wake of the Horus heresy have remained within the Imperial Navy, and so their organizational structure has been fairly strict for the past 10,000 years. The Navy will be broadly split into five large fleets, each of which has been assigned to one of the five segmenta of the galaxy, and from here they will be further subdivided into armadas which are stationed to patrol the various sectors and subsectors of their region. An important point to note here is that the Imperial Navy exists as the militant branch of the larger organization named as the Imperial Fleet. This consists of the aforementioned Navy, which performs all military operations within the galaxy, as well as of the merchant fleets and of the civilian fleets. The third large-scale change to the Imperial Army was the implementation of commissars. Whilst the newly formed leadership structure, as well as of the split between the Imperial Guard and Imperial Navy, were instrumental in preventing a future insurrection, the High Lords required an additional method of ensuring that the new organizations would always remain loyal to Terra. Though all would like to believe that the faithful men and women of the Imperium would forever place the well-being of mankind above their own goals and aspirations, the events of the Horus heresy had clearly painted a different picture. No longer could the High Lords presume that their armies would remain devoted to their cause, and so they required some form of reassurance that the Guard could be kept as a trustworthy organization within the young Imperium. As such, the concept of a commissar first came into existence. They were to be officers who were solely tasked with maintaining order within the Guard, in the hopes that it would reinforce a sense of steadfast allegiance with the wider Imperium. They themselves were seen as the incorruptible exemplars of the Imperial Creed, who could inspire a sense of dutiful purpose within even the most meek or misguided of guardsmen. But they were not simply to lead by example, and these officers were granted with the right to punish any who they saw to stray from the light of the Imperium. If there was to be a member of a platoon who disobeyed an order, or was suspected of working against the best wishes of his company, then the Commissar would be permitted to order a summary execution. This would most often be performed in public, 
with the entire company bearing witness to the fate of traitors, all to cement the notion that they were to remain loyal to the Emperor or die in their vain pursuit of power. In order to ensure that the Commissars themselves remained loyal, they were kept somewhat separated from the rest of the Imperial Guard command structure. Recruits would be drawn into an organization known as the Officio Prefectus, where they will undergo an extensive training and indoctrination program, forever cementing them as fervent servants to the Imperium. The Commissars have rightfully been dispersed throughout both the Imperial Guard and of the Imperial Navy, ensuring that no actions taken by these immensely powerful military branches will ever act outside of the purview of the Imperial Creed. As it stands today, the Astra Militarum are arguably the single most important armed force which exists within the Imperium. Whilst, yes, the Adeptus Astartes, or the Custodian Guard, or even the mysterious Grey Knights have a vital role to play, they simply cannot respond to the various dangers of the galaxy in a more timely manner than of the Imperial Guard. Carrying the Emperor's faith within their hearts, the various regiments will be deployed en masse, bringing with them the centuries of martial tradition built up from engaging within dozens or even hundreds of distinct war zones from across the breadth of the galaxy. Every asset at their disposal will be utilized to its utmost efficiency, with great brigades of armored tanks paving the way for the thousands of charging guardsmen behind them, all of whom will be covered by the thunderous blasts of heavy artillery fire. Being supported by their brothers and sisters, the many soldiers of the Imperial Guard stand as the ultimate bulwark of humanity within the stars. Even with the various horrors which lurk out in the void of space, none may contest with the indefatigable will of the humble warriors of mankind, who are each prepared to lay down their lives for the furtherment of the aging Imperium. There is no cause more noble and no battle more worthy of your efforts than of the eternal conflict in safeguarding our species, and rest assured that if you are to fall as a member of the Imperial Guard, then your soul will be forever protected and you will ever be remembered as a martyr who gave their everything for the betterment of your kin. Dearest friends, this shall conclude today's sermon. I thank you all for listening to this story with me, and I hope that you will all join me again for a future tale. But for now, I shall wish you all a good day.